Joaquin, this is a great day for me. You are a sailor, a true sailor. So it was a no brainer to have you here on this podcast. So thank you so much, man. Really happy. I love, I love the proposal and the whole idea. And I, uh, that's what I say yes uh, in a second. And you know, you, you, you want to know what? Like, it's funny because we actually opened the first office in Miami mm -hmm. because we wanted, uh, my dream was to be able to do advertising and live on the ocean. That's that awesome. was my dream. That's awesome. And we opened the office in Miami because it was a city where you can have the ocean and do advertising. It's funny. So Great. imagine how much I love you, uh, <laughs> the ocean. So look, man, I know that your ocean is going to be beautiful. We're going to go through it. Seven questions, like the seven seas. And I would say let's start right away on the first question, okay? Yes, perfect. First, you cannot discover new oceans unless you have the courage to leave the shore. This quote from Andre Gid brings us back to the day of La Comunidad. Now, at the age of 30, very young, you left a safe shore, BBDO, and you went on to found your own company, La Comunidad. Now, I know, I'm sure that your vessel is filled with memories from that time, but my question is more about the moment you wave farewell to the shore. Was something that clicked inside you? It happened in a moment, or it was a very pre-planned decision? I mean, I wanna, I wanna tell the whole truth and nothing different than the truth. Um, I love what I do, and, and it's a family thing. My father has an agency, my grandfather has an agency. Um, so I don't know, it was like, I was a kid and I was watching my dad taking photos for Adnad or, um, but at some point <clears throat> working on, um, I mean, working on a big company I, I, and I'm super happy with my years at BBDO. Um, I had a very, very good mentor that is the, the father of, Argentinian advertising, and I learned from him like a lot. Um, he's, he's called David Rato. Mm -hmm. uh, but at some point, I, I start to feel like um, I wasn't enjoying my job. Uh, and I, I don't know, I, I'm, I'm sure you agree, but I, I think the, the um, there's a lot of, uh, Happiness is my main goal, okay? As, as basic as it sounds. Um, and I wasn't happy, you know? So I, I thought about quitting advertising. Uh, and I was, I had a Buddhist teacher. I'm, I'm, I studied Buddhist for 22 years now. Uh, I have a teacher and, you know, I, not the religious part, but the philosophy part. Um, and I started having that conversations with her about me wanting to do something else. And she made the right question. She said, do you, do you hate advertising or do you hate the way you are doing advertising? And I was like very clear in a second. I said, no, I love advertising, but I hate the way I'm doing advertising. You know, those years were the years of where media was key. So you were pushed for by the big corporation to do tv and do big media and i don't know there were a lot of things that for me attempted to the soul you know attempted to obviously i, I, I there's an artistic side of what we do that i love and 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 i think that, that that's kind of the mystery that i that i that i that i like about what we do that is two plus two is not always four you know like, it's, there's not a formula to seduce someone. There's not a formula to be interesting. There's not a formula to, to capture someone's attention. Uh, and I was forced into formulas too much. So 
and then you feel like you're in this in this big company that and you realized, at least from my perspective, that the people who are actually doing everything were 15 people, 20 people. Uh, so I said, what if you are just those 20 people, you know? <laughs> Why? Uh, and eliminate, I mean, I don't want to sound uh, mean or anything at all, but that was my sentiment when I was 30. <clears throat> and and, and, and my, my answer was, I love advertising, but I hate the way I'm doing advertising. And her next line was, okay, why don't you do advertising differently? <laughs> and I'm like, okay, but how? I might, I might have to own my, build my own company to advertise in the way I want. I was 30 and I, was a, I had a very good job in a very well paid and uh, and, and in a very interesting position. And, and she said, well, maybe you should open your company. I was like, hmm, I, I never thought about it. It came in that dialogue. And, and so then it was like, okay, maybe I should open my company. And then the second thing was like, who I should open the company with? And I was like, well, and it's funny because at BBDO with my brother, we worked together for a year and a half because uh, he became creative director there. He's three years older. <clears throat> and I was a copywriter uh, at BBDO. We were both copywriters. Then he, at some point I moved, uh, you know, because I was growing and sometimes you need to go to another agency for, be rec for you to be recognized, you know, because they saw you grow. <clears throat> so I decided to move and my brother was um, promoted as a creative director. Uh, um, and he brought me back because he liked the way I work. So that was kind of a, an experiment of working together. And we did, the, we did amazing. We won awards. We, so we, it was a very nice experience. So I, I thought, well, my brother, I should have done a company with my brother. Awesome, man. I mean, he was at Wyden at that time, uh, doing great. Uh, but he also was there for five years and he was also like uh start to he started to think okay what should we do so then we we it's funny and you're gonna laugh but uh we started to talk about opening an office uh, first we thought buenos aires jose was like i should use all the years that i have in in the us already so maybe we should open here and there okay where Miami, LA, no, Miami has the ocean, LA too, but Miami is eight hours and LA is 15 hours from BA, so we should do it Miami. There was all like, this is, very this casual is awesome. conversations on the phone and we're like, okay, let's do Miami and Buenos Aires. Like people think we are crazy that we open two offices at the same time. And then we say, okay, what do we do? And we say, okay, let's go on a boat. So it's completely related to, to your idea. And we literally rent a boat right. for 10 days. And we went on the boat uh, and we were only talk about the, the agency and how we wanted to do it and, and the name. So the community name came on that trip and, and we have this idea of, okay, let's be that people. And, and it's still, to, today we are like 200 people uh, with offices in, in London, uh, in New York, San Francisco, Miami, and Buenos Aires, but we kept the same idea. Like the offices are small, and Miami, that is the biggest office, is divided into communities. So we have the yellow community, the green community, the red community, to keep that feeling of those 20 people, you know? I mean, so I they... remember, I remember, look, like this story is amazing. Well, first of all, thanks for answering this question so eloquently. And the Buddhist, like, advice, I think, like, is precious, right? It's not... Yeah, so simple, right? <laughs> right? It's not that you hate advertising. You hate the way you're doing advertising. We apply so much on every single creative out there. But secondly, I have to say, you just tap into my memories. Uh, raised in, like, born in Europe, or, like, you know, I was working in Milan, at Leoburna, Milan, and those were the days where, I think, in 2004, uh, 2003, I, I won the Clio and like I traveled to Miami 
And there was this like urban legend of the Mola brothers that they opened this agency. <laughs> That was not a real agency, it was an apartment on the ocean, a villa on the ocean. And I remember this friend of mine telling me like, dude, you should see these guys, like they, they live like in this apartment. I was like, wait, it's not an agency? Yeah, it is an agency, but it looked like a mansion. I mean, it was, it was a house on the ocean. <clears throat> um, and you know, like th there's, a, there's a lot of things that, that were part of, of, of that, we still have the house, by the way, <clears throat> um, that were so simple. We said, literally, we said, uh, well, we, we work for people, we, we should, it would be cool to have neighbors. It would be cool to, to live like a family. So we opened in a house in Buenos Aires and in a house uh, here, and we were surrounded by real people instead of corporations. So, right. so you, we, we will have the neighbors talking like that. They, they, like, right. so, so then it, uh, we said, okay, we should have, a, 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 we, in each house we have a, a woman that was like the, the, she runs the house and she will cook for us every lunch. That was an amazing so, concept, dude. Like, that's, so, that's so great. we lunch, have lunch together and it was like a family. And, you and, guys and were so ahead. So ahead of time, uh, I do. But in a way, so simple too. You Thank know what I mean? People. Yeah. And we were like, well, we don't want to be in a big building or in an office. What is an office? Like, now people are working in their houses. It's so funny, right? It's funny. That's what I say. It's like two, like almost twenty years ahead of time. Anyway, man, this is great. Just like it just really touched my memory so vividly. So happy that I met you, man. I'm crossing your ocean. Yeah. I have a question for you, is the second question, is about ocean, it's about a painter. And I, and I see a lot of painting like behind you, but right. uh, there's a painter, a Japanese painter called like Kokusai, and he's considered to have painted one of the most imaginative and fascinating representations of a wave. The wave becomes a giant monster, a levitan, treating with his fangs the ships and the boats that cross the Japanese sea. Bridging this to the creative business, we as a creatives, companies, are threatened every day by monsters, personal monsters, creative monsters. We are crushed by giant waves. Now, the wave of insecurity to not be confident of what we do, if we are good enough, is something that is a common trait among creatives. My question is like, what is your personal monster? What you feel that is threatening you? My personal monster, wow. You have to have one. Uh, I mean, say, no, no, I have a few. I mean, in the industry, um, I don't know. I I I am. Um, I'm thinking if it's a monster to myself or is what I think is the monster that I deal oh, with. To yourself, to yourself. If you have like. No, I, I think that my my biggest problem is that I, that I'm I I'm tough. I have a thick skin, so then uh, I take everything on me, and and I don't sometimes take care of myself. That, that's my bigger monster, I oh, think. Oh, that's, tell me more about the thick skin and being tough. That's so interesting because I think it's a trait among those that they own a company. You had to have a thick skin. <laughs> you had to have giant shoulder. You know, so, I, have, I have a theory on that, that if somebody wants to own a company or do a big movie or, I, I like to think in, of everything in these terms, like, um you you have a pattern no that is the day like the day is a pattern if you do one day what needs to be done and then the next day you do the same and you repeat that uh enough times then you, you are successful or you have a company or but i all i i use a, a, a um um a even smaller pattern that is uh a question. I, I, I think a lot of things comes to you in, in the shape of a question. I mean, 
is a problem in the shape of a question. Or, uh, and I think people who does great things are the people who answer more correct questions than the others. But we, we are all facing questions all the time. But when you dissect doing a big movie or doing a company to the shape of a question, you make the problem smaller and, and you have to be good at answering questions, obviously, common sense. And that was the way for me to deal with having a company when I was 30, you know? I was like, okay, I'm not afraid. It's gonna come as a question, I'm gonna have to have to answer. Then, obviously, I have to be good answering the most amounts of questions possible. Not all of them, I can fail in some, you know? Uh, there's something that the, 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 there's an Agassi had this famous quote, or I think it was him, like, you don't have to play the best match of your life. Sometimes you have to be better than the one that is in front. Yeah, it was, right? it was, Andre, it was Andre Agassi. Uh, I think and, I thought, and I thought it was like interesting in terms of, okay, let's calm down because I'm, I have a very high bar for myself. That's part of my monsters too. Like I look for perfection, perfection. I now I got better and I understand that perfection is not the point. Um, but uh, but I, 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 I invite anyone who's listening to, to do that because then you can, you can, you can shoot a movie. It's going to come to you for, to, to shoot a spot. My, you may need to answer 150 questions. To do a movie, you may need to answer 2,000. To do a company, you may have to answer 5,000. But when you think that it comes in the shape of a question, you are not afraid anymore. And you think of the right answer. And you just focus yourself. But see, that's, that's a great answer. And I feel like uh, we started that, like, you know, you were debating about do I have a monster? Do I... But then we end up on these question marks. And I mean, like, think about it. The question marks has the same shape of a wave, yeah. right? Yeah. If you see a question mark, you can literally trace a wave. So wave coming at you, as I say, my question, are those uh, how you, are, but you are not- How you, how you surf for them. Yeah, you're not afraid to answer them. And I think this is a great observation and like- Yeah, uh, and if you get, you have fear, then waves will break over you. Exactly. Uh, but if you, if you are not afraid because it's a wave, you take the board or you go under it. Or, so I, I think maybe that's, um, uh, and I think that the, my biggest uh, thing, that's about me. Uh, and that was my way to deal with everything that sounds big. Because, man, I can't, I, I, I was the advisor of a president uh, for four years. Right. And I will be in every meeting. Okay, uh, then I'm working now for the fifth biggest company in America. Uh, I can tell you, so I was lucky enough to be in meetings where you, there's these five, six people that decides everything. And I can tell you, you can go to NASA, you can go to Russia, you can go to the White House, you can think about uh, Tesla, there's always five or six people making decisions in a room and they're having a conversation and they're answering questions. Exactly. So don't be afraid of anyone because even the president of the biggest place, even like has these questions that he has to answer. So we are all facing the same. He has these the waves same, coming at him. Waves. In the, in we are all facing the questions. same waves. I love man, I love. That yeah, I, and I have a, my, Talking about the waves, uh, thinking about the others, I have a very nice metaphor from, from um, David Rato, the guy that is the father. Um, he one day said to me, and it was about the process of getting to something great, you know? Uh, and I think it's so good, it's so simple, and I remember that every time. He said, this is a process, it's like an escalator, you know? It's like, a, like you go step, another step, another step, and you are climbing, you know? Another step, another step, till one of those steps becomes a trampoline. But you never know which one is gonna become a trampoline. Oh man, this is awesome. And he said, you should be a trampoline searcher. You shouldn't stop till you find the trampoline. 
And I think that was part of the community idea. Like, we, we try not to be stuck on, on timings because maybe they give you two weeks, but you don't have a trampoline, you know? So you go to a client with a step and then it's not a trampoline and then you are not doing your job. So my biggest fear is when I'm surrounded by people or creatives or, or clients that are not searching for trampolines and they're okay with a step. That's when I go crazy. I'm the worst working for a bad mission. Like I'm the worst. You give me a bad mission, I'm, I'm a nightmare. And I'm, I mean, I, I love when, when there's a mission. I love when there's a, when there's a place to go. I know when we, when we are trying to build something, uh, when we are trying to search for the, for, for the um, trampoline, for the trampoline, uh, I'm the I'm I'm at my best, you know. Uh, I get super sad when when we just uh, we are all okay with the step, you know. Nice. Uh, so I I my think part of my show was to find people on the other side on the client side that love trampolines too, uh, and I was lucky enough to find a, a lot. Uh, there are not hundreds, but there are people who who want to do who wants to build a brand, who wants to do a great job and is not thinking about their bonuses. And they're the smartest because they know that the bonus is going to come. Right. <laughs> if they do the right job. But I love, <laughs> I, love the, I love the metaphor of the trampoline and I love the fact that you say, see, this is great for like creatives, like to think this way, right? Like step by step, step by step until you reach a trampoline, but you will never know which of the last step is gonna turn into a trampoline. And to be a trampoline searcher, this is a very yeah. unique perspective that uh, I never heard. I, I remember that all the time. And I thought- now, yeah. now you made me remember this all the time. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make this mine and uh, I'm gonna carry with but me. When, when, when you become a creative director that you see so much work and, and you have to inspire so much so many people i'm that's only where i go is this a trampoline or not you know mm -hmm. i i can tell you i the, the what i love the most I, I like i love a few things i love shooting i love editing uh, but i love the creative process when when this back and forth between a group of people where we are doing the steps, the steps, the steps, and then uh, pack, there's a trampoline. Yeah, yeah, because it it's like... Uh, it happened, you know? And it's like, fuck, you know, you have it. It's this that. is like the sparks, you know? Like, uh, I remember when I was a kid, one of the things that I used to do, it was just a personal game. I used to, like, sit, like, in front of the fireplace and watch the spark climbing in the air, like, you know? And some of them, they come in two or three sparkles together, or some, like, they're completely lonely and they climb up the chimney. Some of them, they turn into smoke. Uh, some of them, they, they literally like catch like the fire, you know, it's like, uh, so I think like this analogy is, uh, is extremely, extremely interesting, man. <laughs> man that's, that's right. It's too much. Let's go third <laughs> question. Okay. If, if, you Google, if you Google the question like, why is the ocean salty? I mean, I know that it sounds kind of dumb, but you get something like 34 million, uh, 34 wow. million results in a handful of seconds. Now, it's one of the most common questions out there. Not sure this happened to you, but whenever I say to people who don't work in advertising uh, that I work for advertising, people say, why is advertising so bad? And that's when they get me. That's when I don't know really what to answer. And I start like, you know, mumbling some words, but inside me, there is a fire that needs to be extinguished and it's not. And there is a lot of frustration because you would like people like to appreciate what we do. There is so much heart into it. Now, how would you answer a question from someone that come to you and say, why is advertising so bad? I think because of fear. Like, um, 
a fear of change, fear of trying stuff. Um, I think the the I don't know. I I'm super happy of the times we live in in terms of we don't have anymore a captive audience. You know, in the old days, people will sit in front of the TV and and so even if you do shitty stuff and repeat it enough times, you will get something out of it. Those days are gone. Put something in front of them that they don't like. They just don't give a don't 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 don't, don't care, you know? So um I think that kind of an opportunity for us, for for the people who actually wants to do good advertising, because bad advertising by repetition doesn't work anymore. Um but I think it's fear because you have all these tests and all these formulas and all these things like I hate the word best practices. Oh my god. What are the best practices? Like what, what do you mean by best practices? If everybody does best practices, then everything looks the same and nobody likes anything. So are you talking? So I'm um I'm a fighter. Um and I think uh that's my biggest fight, confronting that system. It's funny because one day I, I remember this conversation with, with an old client. Um, like they they were testing everything, you know. And I I want to be honest with you, I I I love data. I use data, I read data. I don't I hate when you make the decisions based on research. But I, I love to learn and I know to know more and I know I, I'm not afraid of of data and I, I and I'm lucky to have clients that use research the right way um, just to learn and to be better but not to make decisions. Um, but I think that the I don't know I, I that's what I love this industry and that's what I love uh, about being a creative in this industry that there's no formula. Exactly. So that's the magic. It's like trying to understand why Picasso painted the way he painted. Absolutely, man. Uh, I... And the same with falling. It's like trying to build a formula to fall in love. No, like, tell me, how do you explain that? Like, you know, I have I have this simple task. Uh, sometimes I'm running in my head. Like, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a like I love gelato, man. I'm I'm Italian. Like, of course, I love gelato, right? Ice cream. Yeah, yeah. I, so when you too. walk when you walk in a gelateria, right, and you ask for an ice cream, and you choose your own flavor, and the guy is like, you know, the girl like is gonna build the gelato for you, like you know, literally. Now imagine this: the person walking is the client, the gelateria is the agency. He asks for a gelato. He asks for a campaign. But instead of grabbing the gelato from the hand of the person that built it, he passes it on to someone else and say, hey, can you lick it? Can you eat it? Let <laughs> me know how it goes. Is it good? Oh, no, he doesn't like it. Then he brings it back to you and say, oh, they don't like it. And you say, wait, I thought the gelato was... <laughs> anyway, this is just... But, uh, no, but, but the, the, the conversation with this client was something similar. He we will do things and they will test and they will define with the one that tested better, no? And then we will put it on the market and a few times it didn't work, okay? And he will keep doing the same process and the same test. And I told him, if you give me one opportunity of doing something without testing that I believe in, that I think will build your brand and you put it in the market and it doesn't work, you wouldn't give me that opportunity again in a hundred years. Exactly. Okay? Why you keep repeating this process that is failing over and over and over? Because you have a piece of paper, you have a piece of paper that says people like it, and then you put it on TV and people don't buy. Right. So, and he said, and he was like, You're right. I didn't thought about it. But I told him, you give me if you give me one chance and it fails, you will never ever give me that chance again. And you give you keep repeating the same thing over and over. It's so I, I, he was like, interesting point. Okay, so you were born with the Atlantic Ocean around you. <clears throat> you hail from Argentina, the country that gave birth to one of my favorite writers, which is like Borges. 
Now, I've been carrying one of the Borges quotes in my backpack for as long as I can remember. And the quote says, <clears throat> plant your own gardens and decorate your own soul instead of waiting for someone to bring you flowers. I think it's a wonderful advice, a very, very insightful observation. What do you do on a daily basis to make sure that your garden is well kept? What does your king do? Oh my God, I do a lot of stuff. At some point in, in I don't know, because of, of my head or what, but at some point I, I knew that I needed to do a lot to be fine. Like I need a lot of things to keep me balance. Uh, um, if not, my wild horses uh, make me pay the price. <laughs> uh, but there's one, one way to say that, that, that I love that I heard the other day is, why don't you give to yourself the love you're expecting others to give you? Mm. Mm. You know, that we all go for life expecting everybody. And it was like, why don't you give it to yourself? It's kind of a, a, a more Buddhist way to say the same thing. Um, but basically, um, I am, I'm a sponge. Like, I, 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 I prefer to do fewer things deeper than to do a lot of things shallow. So I, I started to paint. At some point, I discovered that I was a writer and I could see my art directors suffering from a bad creative director that usually, I don't know, at, at some point in my career, there were a lot of creative directors that came from writing rather than art direction. Right. So I could see them suffering because they were getting a lot of instruction from somebody that didn't understand color, that didn't understand balance, that didn't understand a lot of things. <clears throat> so I said, okay, if I want to be a good creative director, I have to learn that. So I started to paint. Okay. Uh, just to learn that, to become a better creative director for my art directors when I was, and it was funny because the community uh, was super well known because of the craft. Uh, and I, I think it was part obviously because we hire a lot of talented people but I, but I learned so much about that that I was a good you know creative director and instead of cutting everybody's legs I was in uh, you know um, but then I, I keep painting for I don't know that was when I was 24 so almost 26 years now that's how deep I go and I paint and I I love art I collect art I go to every exhibition you can imagine but i usually paint and i um, I, I love it because i think uh, and i write sometimes too i used to write a lot now i'm kind of going back a bit to writing but i i wanted to use words and use colors and use for no reason at all you know because you, you use the words for marketing or for advertising and for uh, so it was like a way to free myself from, like, balance the act, you know? But this is what I found extremely, like, liberating for myself. What you just say, for no reason at all. Yeah. It's the answer that I give everybody when they ask me, like, why do you write? You know, the first answer is, like, well, I write because, to me, it's like drinking a glass of water. Would you stop drinking? No. So the same reason. It's like I wouldn't stop writing. Like yeah, a it's, not, it's, not like you, it's not like you choose it. It's like your soul or something needed. This, for example, uh, is I, I, I do a lot of meetings where I have a, a, a book and I paint while I talk and I, and I don't even care if what I do is good or bad. Or, it's just a way just to do it. You yeah, just do, to it. do it. And it's the process of doing it, the smell of the paintings, cleaning the brushes under the water uh, and and now i'm putting i'm i'm taking the pages out of like i don't know i may have like 50 books um, and i'm putting them on the wall to see what i like what i don't and and i'm doing the the after process but after some of these things may ha have been uh, done 
seven years ago, you know? You remind me a lot of uh, another guest that I had the pleasure of having on board, the Marcello Serpa. And uh, well, he's, he's a great painter. And like, you know, he paints and like, you know, he lives in Hawaii. And, uh, and he was telling me the same thing that you just told me. He told me like, I don't care if it's good, it's bad, I just do it. Yeah. Just because it comes out of me. And I feel like, and he also was talking about painting and creativity. And I think that's uh, this liberating force that we have is so important because it's literally like if you start cutting yourself out of this process, that's when you bump into a wall and you crash eventually. But to keep it like so spontaneous and just like yeah. very liberating is essential. Thank you so much, man. Okay, next question. <laughs> I hear that you have been sailing for a while. We know now, right? Uh, I mean, like the ocean for you is very, something very familiar. Mm -hmm. So I have an analogy for you here. Generally, when you don't have enough momentum to get through attack, you will find yourself head to wind. You only need to back the jib and that will get you onto the original course. And eventually you will get momentum again. Now, it seems to me that this kind of like maneuver is very, very, uh, how would you say, very common in the advertising agency. Mm -hmm. Companies and creatives lose momentum all the time. And in order to regain momentum, they need to actually take like, you know, courage in their hands and do this kind of maneuver. So my question for you is like, uh, do you remember the last time that you as, as a person individual or your company lost momentum and you had to do this kind of maneuver to regain momentum? Yeah, I, I think, it, I, I think, I believe a hundred percent in what you're saying. I think there's a flow, um, and being a sponge and being curious and reading and looking at things and, and learning and uh, is part of the trick to keep that flow. I, I see it like a red uh, cord that you keep, you know, like bringing uh, and, and if you stop, it gets stuck. Um, I think at some point, um, for example, uh, I, the, the moment I can remember clearly was after being in Argentina uh, for 10 years running there. I was running with my rather both offices and I will come to Miami a lot. Um, but I start feeling that in a way, I don't know how to say it, but I was doing the same again and again. Not, not because I was, it was different brands. It was different. Um, outcomes i'm not saying it was the same thing but the process of doing it was too similar um and i felt that i was getting uh i don't know like like i i knew too much to keep doing like all the like all the things you learn and all of a sudden you keep answering the same questions exactly. in a way you know and you answer them so many times that they start to get uh to get boring yes and in a way but boring yeah you start to be less passion and then so um in a very weird way at that moment i was exactly in that moment and they called me um to run uh, i mean this uh, pol i hate politics and i promise that i will never do politics in my life <laughs> which is funny funny how life changed you know um I learned that lesson, man, with, with uh, one thing. I, 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 I'm divorced now, but with my ex-wife, which I have a great relationship, um, we, we built this house in Argentina. Like we were like two years and a half, like beautiful on the water. Like I love architecture. I love houses. Like I, I will get at night and look at houses. Like I'm, I'm bo bo boats, houses. I, I love to watch um, so it was like Ormigon, you know, like this is, it was a house to live for a hundred years. After three years, I moved to Miami. <laughs> and I, I, and I was, I, I remember thinking 
my kids are gonna grow here and I'm gonna like and that was one of the biggest lessons. I'm like I'm not planning anything anymore like this is this is not the way to live this is thinking this way is completely wrong um and I think uh, I mean that was a, a big lesson and and at that moment when I was feeling stuck as you said um I got this call from from this party uh, where the guy was already running the city of Buenos Aires, which is a very interesting city. He was the mayor. He was the mayor for two years already. So he had two more years as mayor. And and it was funny. I, they called me like the, the person who contacted us. I knew no one there, which is the opposite of what they told you. Know? Oh, he knows the guy, like no one. They just called the 10 best creatives for for someone choose the 10 best creatives for him and they had interviews with all of them. And I went, um, I went there, I, I went after the fourth call. My, this guy was like, Joaquin, you should meet them. Like meet them. Like, yes, it's politics, it's politicians, but these are different people you should. So I went and it was funny because I'm like, man, I'm not the guy you want. Like, I won't lie. I study Buddhism. I hate politics. I don't even like you guys. It's like, I don't even know. Like, I, um, he said, Joaquin, that's exactly what we are looking for. Somebody from completely outsider. Uh, and the more I would say no, the more like, and to be honest, I like, I first met a, a guy that um, he became then the second most important guy in the country, the chief of staff, which I keep a relationship with him because he's amazing. One of the most interesting people I, I ever worked with. Um, and he convinced me to meet the candidate. Mm. And, I went, and I went to see the candidate and he was super, I mean, the perception on the media was like, he was, you know, a business guy, super cold engineer. He was completely the opposite, at least to me. And, and I remember thinking, I'm 40, at that time I was 40, and I never believed in anyone on politics. Uh, maybe, I mean, I would love to to believe in someone, you know? Um, so I met him and he was like, well, Joaquin, they say good things about you. What do you want to do? I'm like, man, I want to be honest with you. Like, I don't know. I, I kind of like you. Uh, Marcos was the guy that I would talk to before. Um, and in a way that the, the um, I, I kind of thought that I should believe some uh, shall believe someone at some point like it is impossible to live your whole life without believing in any politician in any um so i don't know i think believing is a process i can't press a button and like you and i don't know you it's the first time i see you uh, so i'm open to start a process and see how i feel and how you guys feel and then see if, if we don't like each other fine if we like each other and you know for for the perception the world had of him, he would have been like, okay, thank you. He was like, oh, that's super interesting. I also believe that believing is a process. So let's start the process. And then I had one of the best experience of my career um, that was 10 years. He, I, I, he became the mayor again. I mean, running the communication of a whole city is amazing. A city like Buenos Aires. Right. And then running the communication of the whole country for four years. And being so close to that small, it's a, it's a, I learned so much. It changed my career and my mind completely. And I think I'm a bit much better creative because of that process. And I think I'm more prepared for what's coming than before. Like, I don't know, when this crisis of COVID happened, I, I'm working now uh, a lot uh, for one brand because as I told you, I prefer to choose uh, to be more focused and go deeper. Um, and I was so used to crisis after 10 years of running a country. I mean, four of the country, 10 of city of Buenos Aires is the biggest city. Imagine if, if, if you if you advise the president of Italy, you, you become a master of crisis. <laughs> Every every morning, the newspaper is a crisis, you know. Right. Uh, so when COVID happened, I was like, oh yeah, boom, and I was so fast and so, um, and and for me it was like what I did for ten years, you know. So I think that again, uh, it's 
important to, it's not, I always said, it's not wrong to get stuck. The, the, the problem is when you don't realize you are stuck. Right. And you don't, I, I don't, you don't, and you don't do anything. Um, and I think that's, that's, um, it's part of a process yeah. and where yeah. that takes you. And it took me to a place that I have never imagined, you know? There's a phrase that uh, goes, uh, people do change life because they suddenly realize that they can. And yeah. I think that uh, it's uh, something that happens to you, right? You say, like, I would have never thought that I would get involved in politics, but you did. And I think, like, that kind of decision came because you did realize that you could change, that it was time for you to change. So I think that... Uh, and they were interested in that they believe in, uh, in communication. I think that's key, man. Like, I remember once I was pitching something in Argentina, and it was the first years. And the guy that was the second guy was uh, would tell me, well, we need to have the meeting with the president. He doesn't believe much in the power of advertising and communication, so we need to convince him. I'm like, no, 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 no. No, man, I'm sorry, I'm out of the pitch. He was like, what? I'm like, no, I can't. It's, it's hard to do great work, even when everybody's convinced that advertising and communication works. Right. If you start from trying to convince someone, like you start from so far, you know? And I think that's a message. I would, I would, I mean, I, I would love people to know, don't waste time in the wrong clients. It's a waste of time. Hmm. Like find people on the other side that understands and believes in the power of communication. Because even with that, it's hard to be great. But we spend too much time working for people that they just don't believe in that. And, and I'm, I'm, I don't know, life is too short, you know? This is, this is an amazing advice, man, because there is a lot of bravery in it. Because I think yeah. that so you are voicing a, a sentiment that many have and house inside, but they don't have the guts to spit it out and like, you know, and I'm, I'm very grateful that you say that because it's true. Life's too short to like waste your time, your creativity, your energy, your energy on something and, that is not rewarding. Yeah. And it's, a, and it's basic, man. It's impossible to do great work with a bad client. It's impossible. Right. Uh, and I'm beyond brands. Uh, obviously, if you tell me a nice brand, it feels like charming, but it's not the brand. It's the people behind the brand what matters. You can have the best brands with the wrong people, and you can have brands that are okay with the right people, and you can do amazing. Of course. Of course. So, so I think that the, it's like, but it's not even like, I, I don't know, like you, a, a film director has to have the great actors, you know? An sure. architect has to have the great client. Like a, a, an architect, imagine, I don't know, uh, I don't know, uh, the best architect with all the wrong clients, they, they will have never ever been able to do a great house. Absolutely, man. I, I, like, you know, that, 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 there is a verse of a poem from John Donne, and he say, no man is an island. And I think yeah. that's like in that verse, there is everything that we have been saying, right? Like, you know, first of all, it's a, te it's a team, it's a team-like work, but again, you know, when you have like the wrong people behind the right brand, the work is gonna be like uh, shitty work, you know? It's like, um, anyway, great, man, great. Hey, look, I almost see the show. I have like a six question to ask you, okay? okay? Okay. So sailors develop like a relationship of hate and love towards the ocean. After a career in the Navy, they end up like even like despising the water of loving the water. Now my grandfather was a sailor. He actually fought in the Second World War in the submarine from 1940 to 1945. And I remember growing up uh, looking at him and like one of my earliest memories is like seeing that he truly hated the ocean because <laughs> connection to the ocean was just like painful it was just like memory from the war now you are a true sailor that crossed the advertising ocean and climbed all the ranks along the way you collected some of the most coveted like accolades and and, and like you know medals and like everything will you always be in love 
with advertising or will at one point stop loving advertising and hating it? It sounds like almost like the Buddhist that told you yeah, early yeah. on, but will you ever be loved with advertising? I, I would, I, I, I think I will always love advertising and, I, and I'm super grateful of advertising. I'm, I'm, I say thanks every morning that I'm able to do what I like and that I'm able to, to, to be listened and I'm able to influence big brands. Um, I, um, I don't know. I think I, I, I can get bored easy. That's what I like advertising because you do a lot of things for different brands and for different, and you learn about different words. Um, no, I, I think what I, I, um, I hate some parts of advertising, but I don't hate, I love the industry and I love our jobs. Um, I think um, I hate how sometimes advertising is so conservative, you know, um, and, and builds all these systems to, to, to try to pretend that you're not taking a risk, but you're always taking a risk, you oh. know? That's what I tell to clients. You do the typical ad, with a typical man, with a typical slogan, and with, you are taking a risk too. You are taking the risk of throwing a hundred million dollars into the media and nobody, nobody looking can. at it. <laughs> so it's, you're always taking risk. Um, so I kind of, I think the formulas um, are what I hate, uh, but when you find the right missions, it's amazing. That's so, all. No, I will always be grateful, even if at some point I decided to, to paint. But I, I, I like, I don't know, I don't know what I will do with my brain if I don't have a show. <laughs> <laughs> hey, man. All right, look, last question. So this question we asked to uh, our guest, and it goes like this. If there was a wind that blows your sail and you had to name it, what would the name be? Hmm. That's a good one. Like a name, like like how you call storms, like putting a name to a wind. Yeah, of your wind that blow your sail. <clears throat> um. I think. Oh, that's a. I I would love to find a cool name, but I don't know. Uh, well, let me help you. Well, I mean, you say, I mean, this stuck with me, but the trampoline story, <laughs> I thought it was amazing. And so the trampoline win. The trampoline <laughs> win. To me, that's that's what Joaquin Mola is. I mean, okay. man, that story really stuck with me and like step by step, but you, you are trampoline hunter, you're trampoline searcher. So... <laughs> I would go with the trampoline win, but I don't want to affect like your your answer. No, it's a good name, the trampoline win. I like it. <laughs> uh, it's a good it's a good catch. Uh, so see, we're already working as a team. Uh, <laughs> I like that. Man, look, this was what a journey. I mean, I can't thank you enough for giving like your time, and like can't thank you enough for having like on board the transatlantic. So thank you so much, Joaquin, and I wish all the best to you, La Comunidad, your family, and everything, okay? Okay, thank you so much for the invitation. I love the idea. Keep doing it, please. Thank Consistent. You, thank like you, me with man. the painting. Keep doing it. Maybe you end up in our age, you know? <laughs> thank you, man. Bye-bye.